Thank you. Want, yes, I want to remind you before we get started, after tonight, where are we headed for the la- home stretch after tonight? At the beginning of your notebook, if you, if you have all the handouts, you would have gotten a table of contents, and I just want you to see where we're going to be starting next week through the end of the semester. Next week, we're going to look at what God's word has to say about finances, being a good steward of those and how important that is to just the overall health of our homes uh, and how when we're not healthy there, it can really be detrimental to the life of our, of our families. The following week, we're going to look at another one of those little potholes that can trip us up in the life of our family, and that is just our time management. Uh, busyness can be one of those things that can just suck the life out of out of your family. So we're going to talk about that and how maybe God's word speaks to that. And then the last four or five weeks are all about parenting. So we're going to answer the question, what does God's word have to say about who I am as a parent? What does God's word have to say about who are my children? We are going to talk about how to protect our kids. What does God's word say about our responsibility as parents uh, in that area? And then on May the 1st, we have a special guest joining us, Randy Frazee, who used to be on staff at Oak Hills uh, with Max Licato. He is going to be with us that night and talk about what is the greatest thing I can give my kids. Um, I'm excited for him to be with us that night. Uh, It's going to be a special treat for us to have him here with us. And then the last night is just going to be kind of a wrap up for the, for the whole semester. What have we learned? What is it God wants us to do with this information? Uh, and how do we take it with us and, and have it impact our family? So help us spread the word. This is kind of one of those midway points sort of through this semester. So remind your friends, your growth groups, uh, hey, come on back out. If you don't have something going on, be here on Wednesday nights for, uh, for the rep, part two of Family Matters. So hope that you will you'll be here for that. Um, and I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to pray. And Rick and Sue, you guys, we're on. Got, you're on. So you better bring your A game. This is right. this is it. All right. I'm ready for it. Father, we thank you for tonight, uh, God, for this opportunity, um, God, just to just each and every week to be in awe of and encouraged by how your word speaks to every possible need and situation that we will encounter in life. God, how your word teaches us about relationships uh, and God, how to, how to have healthy relationships. Father, everything that we need for life uh, is found in your word. It is found in you. You are the source of all things. So God, would you be our teacher tonight? God, we thank you tonight for Rick and Sue, uh, for their commitment, their investment of their time, uh, their training over the years, and their willingness to just share that with each and every one of us. So God, I pray just blessings upon them and their continued ministry. God, that you would just continue uh, to just multiply the impact that, that they have um, in the lives of families here in this community. God, we love you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Sue, what did you mean to say tonight? <laughs> I was going to say it's a blessing to affirm everybody here in our church and how great it's to be here, Pastor. Yes. So you never know. You don't know what's going to happen. So this is week six for us. It's week eight in Family Matters. Um, and we just want to thank thank the church for the gift and but most of all thank our pastors for making family matters and marriage matters a priority Um, i can tell you having been in the marriage ministry space in san antonio for 14 years uh, not all churches recognize this is very important and vital to the members of the church so i thank our leadership for making this a priority Okay, final week, and guess what? Remember how we started out week one? We started out with With a quiz. quiz. Do you remember that quiz? Those of you who are here week one. Get that handout out. It's a new handout tonight just to make sure you didn't throw away. We want to see if your marital IQ has improved over the last six weeks. So, But we're going to do this as a group. We're not going to put anybody on the spot. We're not going to make you go through this individually. But we do want to go through this and see where we've come. Come. So the Bible defines marriage as a contract between two believers. True or false? True or false? False. Right. It is a 
cup. Covenant. Oh, man. You guys are knocking it out of the uh, park. We, Absolutely. We might have some teacher's pets. In I'm telling you. I love it. Know all the answers. Number two, love can overcome any trouble in marriage. True or false? Love can overcome. We have a false? Do we have, we have a false? It is false. And this is, this is a trick question, sort of, kind of, but Satan uses trick questions all the time, so we can too. Uh, that would be a true statement if we said love was agape love, right? That unconditional sacrificial love, then that would be a true statement. Three, the Bible commands the husband to love his wife and the wife to respect her husband. True. Lots of truths. That is true. I like you being it. You're right. Ephesians 5. Say it with conviction. Absolutely. Number four, God's word encourages divorce in specific instances of adultery, abuse, or addiction. You don't have that one. Oh, no. What's your number four? Okay. We will not be be married in heaven. True or false? True. Okay. That is true. That was kind of, that was thrown in. Who there. are we married to? This will come up. Christ. That's right. right? We're the bride of Christ. Amen. So we are technically married in heaven, just not this way. My spouse, true or false, my spouse can make me angry. Do you have that one? <laughs> false. Right, everybody's like, yeah, I know the answer is false, but that's not true. No. <laughs> It, it is false. My spouse cannot make... Remember when we did the communication? Uh, I still it, question that one too. Right? We, we said our response, my response in marriage is my responsibility. My spouse cannot make me angry. I can become angry. I can allow myself to become angry. But that is a reflection of my relationship with my God. Let me make sure I'm on the right list here. Six, happiness is the key to a successful marriage. Oh, I like that. I love the, love the Ooh, sounding false. People. Right, because if happiness is your yardstick for marriage, you are in for a roller coaster marriage. It's a terrible yardstick. Remember, we talked about that. God gave us amazing emotions, but if we gauged our marriage success on emotions... Right. Welcome we'd to be, the roller coaster. We'd be on a huge roller coaster. Number seven, there is a crisis in marriage today. It's true. Oh, false. that is absolutely false. a false statement. I think Pastor and, Daniel preached on this. Yes. In fact, January 14th, he preached this. That is a false statement. And why is that false? Marriage is exactly as God designed it 4,000 years ago. Nothing's changed. His word is the same. What has changed, what, where's the crisis? In our theology, what world we believe. View, right? we, we, are, we are very yeah. susceptible to worldview and how it affects Culture has crept thinking. into our thinking and we think secularly about marriage. Let me put that one another way. No, never. No. So let me, let me just, because you all will answer yes to these questions. Do you believe God designed marriage? Yes. So if God designed it, is there a crisis in marriage? Not in marriage. Not in marriage. We may face many crises, right, in our life, but the way God designed marriage was perfect before sin entered the world. We may have a crisis in our marriage. And by the way, God says, if you marry, you will have trouble. Wait, that's a question. So you're you're living out biblical truth in your marriage when you have trouble in your marriage. Okay, number nine, God wants, no, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Eight, God wouldn't want me to stay in an unhappy marriage. False. false. That is absolutely false. God loves this thing called marriage. Uh, he doesn't want us to be in an unhappy marriage, but he wants marriage to make us holy. God, in fact, his, his intention for marriage is, if, if we are in trouble in our marriage, his intention is for forgiveness and reconciliation. Ooh, perhaps that's a question. Maybe that's another question. Ooh. 
Okay, nine, God wants us to be able to manage our fleshly behaviors in our marriage. Ooh, now you all are questioning. I see the oh, looks. I, I, hear, I see some, hmm. That's, mm, is that a, mm, how do we do here? How do Rick, we do here? Are Rick and Sue throwing us? Some thinks it's true. Okay. Thinks? Okay, that's good. Be brave, be bold. Okay, you think it's true? Does anyone think it's false? Okay. No one thinks that's We're all waiting for the trick way my husband worded these questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Oh, you show, secular show. thinking people. <laughs> okay, so managing fleshly behavior is the secular answer to transformation. Okay, managing our flesh is our solution to what God wants, which is transformation. So when we simply manage our fleshly behaviors, we're not transforming, we're conforming to the patterns of this world. God's intention for marriage is to, to lead us into transformed lives, to become Christ-like, not to simply manage fleshly behavior. Let me let me put it another way. I see faces in the room, right? And these these things are, are like, supposed to promote conversation. What? So it's good. So let me ask you this. As believers in Jesus Christ, when we accepted him as our savior, we became indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Yes? So as we deal with our sin, whether it's dealing our with flesh. addiction, our flesh and all that, does God want us to manage it ourselves without him? No. So part of why we want to share the love of God with the world is if you're not a believer, you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't and know how people are managing get through. Fleshly being. I don't know how people get through or how you stay married if you don't have Jesus Christ. And that's the point, right? We're not intended to manage it ourselves without giving it to our God yes. and seeking him. Does that make sense now to everybody? The opposite of managing fleshly behavior is confessing sin and repenting and becoming more Christ-like in our marriage. That's why that is a false. And that's spirit. why we have a church family to share in our struggles and our joys. Okay. So these sound like trick questions. Yeah. Like I said, Satan yeah. uses yeah. trickery. Yeah. So like those it? hugglers, we're so glad to yes. them last night. Yes. Please. Kick them to the curb. Uh, God's word describes his rel relationship with us in marital terms. Oh, that's true. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. From Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between, God describes us as his bride. And he talks about the Israelites and accuses them of what? Ido of uh, adultery. That's a marriage term. He accuses them of being unfaithful. Marital terms, God loves this thing called marriage. Compromise is critical to a healthy marriage. That is false. I know everybody's like, I don't know. That but, sounds but, awfully but. true. Here's, here's why that is not true. Compromise, when we think about it, if I were to go around the room and ask definitions of compromise, we might land on a, a definition of compromise that would make that true. But from a worldly view compromise is what i'll give i'll do this if yeah, you do that, that thing. right it's 50 50 it's conditional that's contractual marriage ladies and gentlemen that's what the world looks at for marriage and we compromise heard. if we think of compromise as i'll do what it takes i'll uh, unconditionally then that, that works. But when we think of compromise as quid pro quo, I'll do this if you do that, we've entered into a contractual marriage, not what God designed marriage for. Or I heard the word settling. If you feel like you consistently settle, you yes. give in. Yes. Then over time, you will again begin to feel either resentment or anger or bitterness, why is it always me who has to give in? As opposed to this biblical view of agape love and sacrifice and not and and unselfishness. All right, where are we here? No, we're not done yet. 
Um, the Bible says, if you marry, you will face many troubles in this life. We've already said that. True. Corinthians. How many have already have faced many troubles in life? Let's just be honest. Yes. Okay. Forgiveness means forgetting. That's false, false. right? What forgiveness means, that which you have done, I will no longer hold against you. Does not mean I will forget, but it does mean I will not hold it against you. Turn over to the other side. What's God's purpose for marriage? I heard it. Yeah. To make You're us holy. Holy. Yes, it's his greatest sanctification tool. What is the source of all conflict in marriage? My spouse. No, no. False. <laughs> My sin. What is, yes, me, my sin. That is the source of conflict in marriage. And what is the, the secret to a successful marriage? Allowing God to transform us, to allow marriage to make us holy, to become more Christ-like in our marriage. That's the question you ask. Is Jesus in the center of our marriage? Name three things God's word requires of the husband. Men. Oh, yeah. Write this, this is down, a men. only question. Men, what are three things God's word tells you you are to do as a husband? Yes. Amen. Love your wife. My agape. girl. One of my girls right there. More importantly, agape your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That should be number one on the list. What else? Men, 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 men. Huh? Provide. Provide. Yes. Okay. Not, yes, that is, a, that is that we are? Not, what, not what I'm looking for, but okay. We'll, we'll take that. First Peter 3, 7. Can I say it? Can I say it? First Peter 3, 7. <laughs> Live with your wife in an understanding way. I should say that again. Yes. My guy is supposed to live with me in an understanding way. And he adds a writer. Remember, he adds a writer to that verse so that your prayers will not be hindered. Hindered. The third, Colossians 3.19. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh. harsh. Right? Men love to banter. We love to banter back and forth. We say things to each other that when women hear them, they're like, oh my goodness, did you hear that? And then the next thing you know, we're slapping each other on the back. Men banter back and forth, and then they think their wives, they should banter back and forth with their wives. Husbands, do not be harsh with your wife. The fourth there is uh, out of Ephesians 5 says, agape your wife, but it also says, that she should flourish under your spiritual headship. So spiritual headship is actually the f on that list as well. You are the head of the home, and your wife should thrive under your spiritual headship. So in other and words, should... to sum all that up, guys, we get to be Jesus in our home. No and small task. Yeah, and that's one of our jokes at home when we talk about ways to communicate in softer ways. I'll look to my sweetie and I'll say, babe, I'm not I'm flourishing not, right now. I'm not flourishing. Okay? Not flourishing. Don't feel understood. That's a very subtle. Not so subtle, but. <laughs> okay, but ladies, a it's, a, it's, a, it's up to you now. Two things God's word requires of you. Submit and Submit oh, look at you, respect. gold star. If and I had the women know what they're responsible yeah. for, guys. So just saying. Another one of my girls, one of my kids, right there. Okay. Submit and respect. Genesis two twenty four described as leave and cleave verse. What does that mean? One plus one is. Uno, right? God's divine mathematics. One plus one is one. We are to cleave and become one flesh. What an amazing design for marriage. Now, here's uh, another aspect of that. It also, that verse identifies priority of hierarchy in a marriage. So God is number one, right? And after God, who comes next? Your spouse. And I will tell you in various seasons of life, when 
when wives, when you have children and you're protective of your precious treasure, a miracle from God and your mama bear, your husbands may not feel like they come first. As we work in our jobs and we sacrifice to provide because we are a family and a husband of honor, if you're the main breadwinner, your wife may feel that she doesn't come first in that example. So this also lays out that hierarchy. The other significant significance of that verse is the leave part. We are to leave our father and mother. That means leave them financially, leave them emotionally, leave them physically. There are obviously times when that's not possible, but that's God's intent is that we are to leave and cleave to this person. And last, what's the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation? Two words that are often confused in and outside the church. Forgiveness. Takes one. Forgiveness requires only one person and is commanded by God. We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. Okay. Regardless of the response of the other person, we are to forgive. Reconciliation. Two people, it takes two people for reconciliation. And we're not, God's desire for marriage is forgiveness and reconciliation. Just, you'll remember, well, we'll talk about those two videos we watched. Oh, we okay. Time. All right. Hey, so how would you, you do? do? How would you grade yourself? A anybody get a, anybody get a hundred? Come on, be honest. I, I didn't think so. Okay. Hey, we still don't get a hundred. Okay. Oh, we ace this every time. No, no, no. Okay. Let's move on. So now we're going to get into a summary of uh, our past six weeks, uh, and then we will move into an affirmation exercise. Okay, so week one, we did marriage myths and truths, um, and we also talked about covenant versus contract, and um, we hit home, I hope, and, I, and I, in, a, right, in the response we received, I think we hit home about the importance of having a covenant marriage and how important the horizontal relationship is to, mer to mirror that vertical relationship. This is where we learned, uh, you can see the resource out of Right Now Media, Sacred Marriage, where we learned that quiz question, what if uh, God designed marriage to make us holy, to refine us? And that was all week one. We talked about covenantal language and this idea of permanence. A contract view is the world view. Things are temporary. Things are transactional. But when we listen to God's view, when you remember your marriage vows, these are covenantal permanence words to have and to hold God. till death. Do us part. God's design does not allow for an out clause in most situations. Okay, week two. Remember week two? We talked about it was Valentine's Day. You all chose to come here. We tried to feed you with chocolate. And we talked about communication. And on Valentine's Day, we also talked about conflict resolution. There's a little bit of, little bit of humor there, right? And in those takeaways, we reviewed, again, this idea, some of you may have taken the five love languages to learn how to talk to each other and to bless one another in their love language. We talked about this concept, I love this, of team us. I love us. Remember the motorcycle story? I would never agree to him getting a motorcycle, right? But team us, Loves we it. create memories. We have fun together. It is just moments that we cherish. And then when we talked about conflict, also in communication, how we choose our words to imagine that Jesus is right there over the shoulder of your spouse. And when you're speaking to your spouse, Jesus is there. So how do we use words that are God honoring? And when we do have conflict and we all, that was a quiz question. We know we all struggle. This idea of team us is if you're fighting to win for you, then you're going to lose because team 
us will lose. Mm -hmm. So the idea is focus on the problem together as a team and not individually fighting to win. Yes. We also that night talked about thorns of the flesh and fruit of the spirit. We did that little exercise where you put a tick mark next to the words that described your actions, behaviors, and thoughts during the past week. And then we lined them up with fruits of the spirit and thorns of the flesh. And we said, who is controlling your thoughts? Whoever controls your thoughts controls your actions, behaviors, um, and therefore it's important you know, God says, that's why God says he wants to transform us through the renewing of our mind. And that was a convicting exercise for me because I will confess what we call thorns, frustration, anger, anxiety. bitterness, anxiety, fear, impatience. impatience. I circle a lot of those on a daily basis, right? And if I'm allowing so much junk to fill me up, how is the Holy Spirit at work? Right. When I have all this stuff that I and don't we allow did that in week two, because that's an important concept for thinking about forgiveness and reconciliation and the topic of divorce. OK, lesson three. Ooh. Oh, yes, it was the roles night, roles of the husband and the wife. And we've already talked about them in the quiz. God has very specific guidance for husbands and wives. Not wrong, just different. We talked about the idea of submission and where that key phrase, the key talk about marriage in Ephesians 5, that actually starts with Ephesians 5.21, submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. Okay. Yes. We had honest conversations about these two words that are tough. My husband mentioned one, submission. Right. For the world's view, for many women, that is a hard, hard word because we've lost that it's submitting to our husband. And if our husband is emulating Jesus Christ in our home, why would I not want to honor and submit to him? We've it is it does not mean domination. We are equal partners, but it's hard and we've got to be willing to talk about it. The other word is this thing called headship, right? And in headship, we already answered what God has commanded husbands to do, but in headship again, to be the spiritual leader of your home, not to dominate, but to lift up to pray for, to set that tone, that sacrificial sense of love, this idea of headship for men. We've got to be able to talk about these things and admit the struggles because this is designed by God. The other two things we talked about, when we talked about love and respect that night, we handed out, there were two critical handouts. One was, what does love look like to a woman? And the other was, what does respect look like to a man? Please don't take those home, put them on the shelf and forget them. Those are great handouts. Those are great discussion topics in your home and great to ask your spouse, honey, what does respect look like to you? Which, what, what on here resonates with you? Honey, what does love look like to you? What re resonates with you? Can I, can I share a real quick story about that? Go Is that fine? It. I'm sensitive to time. So mm. the word respect, okay? Let me give you an example of respect. And we shared this in the AIM workshop when we share it. My husband thinks if we are five minutes late to anything <gasps> that I am wrong and he has been disrespected. And here I am going, wait a minute, we're retired this from the funny. army, right? We're retired from the army. This is First Baptist Church. Everybody shows up late, fights for the back pew. I see our pastor like <laughs> wanting to say what Sue meant to say. I can see that. But it's like, honey, we're retired. We can stroll in. Who knew that my husband received that as a sign of disrespect? So I grew up under Master Sergeant Hugler. Huh? And his guidance was, if you aren't 15 minutes early, you are late. So I go into cognitive dissonance when we are running late. 
So. Now, I will tell you, respect is also important to me. I'm not saying it's not. And as God would have it, of course, my definition of respect is completely different. Not For me, it's different. I have an opinion. And I like vocalizing that opinion. Who knew? And my guy has to live with me in an understanding way. So for me, a sign of respect. She was going to be a lawyer, but. Yeah, no. Yeah, praise God that that didn't happen. So for him, for me, my sign of respect, how many times are we guilty of interrupting another person when they speak? Can you raise your hand to relate? Yes. <laughs> I took that as respect. That if I mattered and he respected me, he would seek my opinion and he would ask for it as we make major decisions. Do you see the dance and the journey that marriage is and why God created it? Because it is a lifetime journey. And that just, I love that last phrase there, number four. Are we listening to Hollywood or are we listening to the Holy Word? Are we listening to the script, the narrative of our culture, or are we listening to Scripture? Okay, moving on. Beating this horse. Yeah, we then moved on to forgiveness and reconciliation. This was a sober week for all of us. As we are blessed to come alongside couples and share uh, in their journey together, this is one of the hardest things we have to talk about, this idea of forgiveness. And you can read and see the highlights. In essence, uh, we've talked about we are commanded to forgive and that our prayers are hindered if we don't. And we learn that forgiveness is a choice each of us have to make. And it is a direct reflection on where we are with our Lord. Amen. And if our Lord forgives us for our transgressions, how can we not forgive others? Then reconciliation. Reconciliation is separate because for many of us, we may choose to forgive, but depending upon the offense, and my sweetie will talk about that, depending upon the offense, we may have wounds. We may have scars or deep emotions that we have got to be able to talk about and review so that there can be healing and restoration. And so a lot of us grew up thinking they were one and the same. And if we if we said we forgive, we can never talk about it again, but we may not be ready to not to, to, right. Does that make sense to us? That happens a lot, uh, as we work with couples, especially with people who've had deep seated issues, right? Not small conflict, but deep seated wounds. You recall that evening we showed several short videos. The first two were couples that had, there was infidelity in the marriage and you remember that, um, early on, they were talking about taking sides and they were listening to counsel from people uh, that were taking their sides. And it wasn't until they sought and found godly biblical advice that things changed and forgiveness was extended. And then we saw in those videos when forgiveness was extended, how hearts were softened. I would commend those videos to you. They're on Right Now Media. Watch them again. And we learned about that ancient practice of the sulha, where the one who is hurt actually goes and offers food and drink to the one who uh, did the hurting and, and how that immediately changes the dynamic, how hearts are softened in, the, in that view. Okay. We then, a couple weeks ago, we had that amazing panel of people who had been through divorce or separation. And we received so much positive feedback from everyone about what they shared how they brought and shared their pain and made it a part of the glory of God. It became their story. How they were open about what it's like to experience divorce and the pain and the loneliness and isolation and how important it is as a church family to come alongside people. Right. Right. That was amazing. And the take one of the, some of the key takeaways there, God hates divorce, but he doesn't hate the divorced. Amen. Right? They are not second-class citizens in church. God's desire, though, is 
always for forgiveness and reconciliation. And no matter what mess we make in life, God can redeem all things. King David is a perfect example of that. Okay. Whew. That leads us to tonight. Whoop, whoop. We are going to be talking about affirmation. What a way to end where we can affirm one another. I will tell you that uh, even if your love language is not words of affirmation, it is very, look at you two laughing at me. That, that me too, <laughs> me, right? Me, me, that's love me. Love language, yes. Words of affirmation. Marriage needs affirmation. We need to remind each other of that, okay? And let me give you a quick example as we set the stage. A lot of times, uh, I talk to myself. Do, do any of you talk to yourselves? Are we honest about that? Richard, my sweetie, my science nerd is gonna share some statistics, but I talk to myself. Now, what do you think I normally tell myself? Good thing. Do you think it's nice? Do you think it's good stuff or do you think it's bad stuff? No. It's negative. It can be some of both. Thank you. I will be honest for me. It's usually negative. It is usually, I use my full name, you know, when I'm in trouble or talking to myself, Susan, you're an idiot. You should have done that better. You should have known that that would happen. I do that a lot. You know, question myself, self doubt. It is Horrible. And we talk to ourselves that way. And in fact, there are statistics. Yeah. I mean, those who study that say 75% of conversation that takes place, who do we talk to the most throughout the day? Ourselves. That's where most of the conversation takes place. And it takes place up here. And the majority of it is generally negative. That usually happens. So the idea of affirming each other in your marriage is so critical. It is so important to take the time to affirm each other. And we're going to lay out that exercise tonight, give you a taste of it. So you can either do it here for a little bit or at home. And for those who are single, we have a plan for you too. So, we Okay, so there. you have a sheet in your handout that says affirmation exercise. Um, the one in the, hand, in the, in the packet has examples. So there's talents, gifts, and strengths. And then there's examples of each of those under talents, gifts, and strengths. And so we are going to give you uh, 10 minutes tops to maybe eight minutes to actually sit down either where you're at, or if you want to go off and, and, you know, into a quiet space somewhere and write down, think about your spouse and then write down their talents, their gifts, and their strengths. Okay? Okay. So does that make sense? Any this questions? This is about your spouse. This is so about So you're going to write what you think are their talents, gifts, and strengths. These are if, affirming. Affirming. If your spouse is not here, still, still do, do the exercise, but take it home and have you fill it out. If you are single, Right. We talked at the very beginning of this that we are married to Christ. Christ is, is our groom, right? We, the church, are his bride. So if you're alone, let's use this as quiet time to seek how he sees you in his eyes. As I said, we normally are very deprecating when we talk to ourselves. Allow God to reveal to you your, how he sees you, your, your strengths, your gifts, your talents, and let him love on you. So Ready? take about 10 minutes. Go. Can you, can you remind them that that extra handout? Yes. Oh, we have, thank you. Yes, thank you, exactly. Pastor. There's What's an extra handout. There? There? So you have one that has all the kind of examples filled out for you. And then there was another one up here. There's still more over there that is completely blank. It gives you room to write strengths, gifts, talents, gifts, and strengths. Okay? Or you can squeeze them into the spaces on the one that has them filled in. However you want to do that, your call. We're going to walk around and heckle you. I mean, encourage you.
You're on. Am I on? Yes. So I know you have tons more to write, and that's okay, because this is not a one-and-done exercise. This is something you can refine over time. So again, another thing that you shouldn't really take home, put on the shelf, and forget, this is a great exercise. We normally do this at the end of a marriage weekend, like if we go to Camp Eagle or somewhere, and we have a, a room full of couples, and they've worked through some tough stuff. This is a great way to end that and we'll we're going to demonstrate how an affirmation exercise works now that you filled that out you're going to then get in what we call the level and congruent position because we don't normally do this there we go hey hi Getting heavier hi <laughs> okay and then we're going to affirm one another. So he talked about level and congruent, okay? And what does that look like? So what happens is we have our phones just because we have our notes. That's where our notes are. Affirmation. But you get together. You're focused on each other. So usually Touching phones are knees blurring. to knees. There's some type of physical contact. You have eye contact. And you're sharing from your heart. Okay, that is called the level and congruent position. Okay. And so we're going to demonstrate this exercise, and then we're going to give you just a little bit of time maybe for you to do it on your own, but this is very powerful to do privately in your own home, right, or something like that. So we'll demonstrate it. Hi, darling. Hi. I just want to tell you the things that I absolutely love about you. And number one is that you are a woman of faith. You are a godly woman. You know God's word and you handle it well. You, uh, you, God has blessed you with the gift of leadership and you are a strong leader. And yet, even though you're a strong leader, you follow well. And so you've you, you're a great helpmate to me because of that. You help me lead well because you're a great leader in and of yourself. You are an encourager, and I thank you for that. You, the glass is always half full in your world, and I, I need that. And you compliment me greatly in that area. You, when you sing to God, when you sing to the Lord, your face lights up and you draw people to you because you draw people to God because they see that you are worshiping our Heavenly Father. I love uh, your musical talent. I love that you play guitar and that you sing and you're teaching yourself to play piano. I love when our house is filled with the sound of the piano and you're just praising God through music. You're creative. You, I did, Who knew that you could crochet? I would be sitting next to you in the evening and the next... The next thing I know, there's a hat, or there's gloves, or there's an afghan. It's amazing to see you in action. You are amazing. You have an eye for decoration, and, and when you get something and when you settle on something, you don't change your mind. You are very confident in the selections you make, and that's, that's a gift. I appreciate that. Um, you are positive. Um, uh, you're tough-minded. You had jobs in the army that would crush the average person. And so I love that beautiful big brain of yours and your tough mindedness. You're such a tiny thing, but yet you're tough minded and you're amazing. Um, and I want to, I'm thankful that even though we've been married for 40 years, you're still a hottie. You still, you still, you still, you still rev me up. You still get me excited. You still, Capture my attention, and I love that about you. Thank you. Thank you, baby. <laughs> Babe, I love you so much. Uh, your talents, you are my Mr. Fix-It. You're my guy. You're my man. You are just it for me. And I love how you take responsibility for our family our home. I love that when you're making decisions for our family, you want what is the best. So you research, uh, you talked about my big picture. It's details that mess me up so much all the time, but you 
are detail oriented and that's what keeps us together and going strong. And I am so grateful that you take that time to research and look at details and make decisions for us that, that is as researched and thought out as possible. You have so many amazing gifts. I love watching how you teach in growth group and your passion for God's word. You love studying God's word. And I wish I had that passion, but to see that gift of exhortation, to want to share God's word with others and look at what God has to say. I just admire that so much. I love that you are a man of honor and that your name matters and our family matters. And I thank you for that. I love how you affirm me all the time and you encourage me, you know, and, and there are so many times, even in church, where I look to see you because I know my God is there, but to see you gives me a confidence that I normally don't have. So I really, really thank you for that. You are, you are just it for me, babe. And you're looking good. Let me just say that. I love us. I love us. Well, thank you. Okay. So, um, that is what an affirmation exercise looks like. And we would like to just give you, because we're running out of, in fact, we're not going to give you that time because we want to talk about legacy. Um, and so is that okay, pastor? Um, yeah, we want to talk about legacy, but I encourage you take what you've written, get face to face, level and congruent, and just affirm your spouse. You will see energy pouring out of them like you've never seen before. So just do it. Don't, don't go, okay, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do this later this week and then put it aside. Please be diligent in your marriage in doing that. Okay? Any questions? Okay. All right. So we want to move on from affirmation to leaving a legacy. And the first thing I just want to do right up front is ask you, when you hear the term legacy, what does that mean to you? Anybody? What does legacy mean? What is a legacy? Crickets. Yeah, your name meaning something? Meaning something, yes. Okay. It, something you leave generally be right. Something that you're going to leave, it survives you. It lives past you. That can be obviously property or money. You can leave a legacy to your children of property or money. But in the context that we want to talk about it, we want to talk about a spiritual legacy, right? What is what are you leaving? to those who will follow you, your kids, your this next generations that will follow you. I'll give you an example. So I grew up in a non-Christian home. I told you, I grew up under Master Sergeant Hugler. He was a strong disciplinarian. He was a hard man. Uh, but there were some things I remember at his funeral that we, as as uh, children that we got together and we talked about the things that dad instilled in us. And so those things would be, he instilled a work ethic in each of us. We were always instructed that you can do anything if you put your mind and your abilities to it. You are what you, how you work. He also instructed us about patriotism. He loved our country, he loved the flag, and he wanted to make sure we loved our country and loved our flag. He also said, if you borrow something, return it in better condition than when you borrow it. If you borrow a lawnmower, sharpen the blade and clean it up before you return it. He, and the last thing he said, whenever he was, um, if we did something, especially if we did something wrong, he would always, he would scold us and then remind us, remember, you're a huggler. You're a huggler. Do not bring dishonor to our name. You're a huggler. And that was so ingrained in us. When Sue and I got married, my older brother, two years older, gave us uh, some silverware as a wedding gift. And on each piece of silverware was engraved an H 
to the casual observer, that was just a neat thing. You put H on it, it stands for huggler. But I knew deep down, my brother was saying, you're a huggler. Remember that. You're a huggler. Don't bring any, ever bring dishonor to that name. So let me offer another perspective of legacy. Way back at week one, we talked about marriage was designed by God. And we talked about covenantal language. In other words, long-term language. And this idea of legacy is, can you think in ter longer terms, not the here and now? So here's an example. First Baptist Church, Bernie, over 120 years old. We were first started in August of 18, I believe, 98, right? Pastor we're getting, we're getting the head nod. That's good. So I think my guess is the founders of our church over 120 years ago weren't thinking of just the here and now. They were thinking of church and the generations to come. The church designed by God for community to be equi to equip the body to advance God's kingdom. Well, we just said, and we admitted Marriage is also a holy institution designed by God. So should we think of our marriage in terms of what is your legacy, Amen. right? What is your vision for your marriage? How do you want to put a stake in the ground that says this is what we want our children to know about us or whatever our legacy is? So, uh, so we're, excuse me, we're going to do a little exercise <coughs> He's choked up from affirmation. It got I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to transport each of you into the future. And I, I don't want to get gloomy here, but we are now at your funeral. You are in a casket and your children or family are around your casket and they are saying something about you. What would you like to hear them say? And I, I actually want to hear you. What are some things you would want them to say around that casket? About, yes, about you, right? Yes. So for instance, for instance, you know, dad loved mom well, or mom was a great encourager, or mom and dad made sure that God's word was spoken in our home all the time. What are the words that you would want your children to say? Love yes, it. yes, mom loved the Lord. Not a, this isn't a test, folks. Just honestly, just, just to make you, you think you'd want to hear. What are some things you would want to hear? Because here is what we want to leave you with. We're ending talking about affirming one another in marriage. And we're also talking about how God designed marriage. And this is a way that people in the world may know the love of Jesus Christ, right? Because if we, by how we treat each other, we as a church family, how we honor and come alongside each other in times of struggle or joy, the relationships we demonstrate, that's how the world knows Jesus Christ, right? When they look and they go, this is different. This is different. My God takes me as I am. I don't have to change. He accepts me as I am. But I want to honor him, and I want to honor what he has created. And so we just ask that you think about marriage yep. also in terms of legacy. What legacy do you want to leave to your children, to those you come in contact with, that they will say and affirm you? So on that sheet, notes on legacy, as you write down things you want your children or your family to say, the reason we do that is to, th to then think, okay, what am I doing now that would lead them to say those things? Am I 
living out a life that is Christ-like in my home and in my marriage that would promote those kinds of statements down the road. Talk about the head. The one pager. Yes. So we also had a handout um, called, uh, let me see, it's the um, marriage, what did I do with it, baby? It's the one that has a mission statement at the top. Craig and, yes, 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 thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Meg. It says, personal mission statement for marriage. This was done by Steve and Cindy Wright. I found this on the website, and I thought it was excellent. It's a one-pager, front and back, one-pager. And it's just them sitting down going, what does our marriage look like? What is our mission statement? Very Army-esque, by the way. But nonetheless, what is, a, what is our mission statement? And what are the core values that we want to permeate our marriage and our home? What does that look like? Uh, sounds sounds academic, but yet if you think about it, when you take the time to do this, then it, it kind of makes you more diligent in your home and in your marriage about what you want your legacy to look like. The other uh, handout you have is called a legacy pledge. The, you can read that at home and look at it. Yeah, this is a Family Life product. Family Life is an amazing organization. They do great work in the marriage space. Um, and this is, uh, again, when we do a marriage weekend, we end with this legacy pledge. It is the husband pledging, um, and then the wife makes a pledge, and then they make a pledge together. It's that putting a stake in the ground. Um, where this day forward, we will do this. And so read through that. And I would encourage you as husband and wife to make a legacy pledge. Okay? So as you see, as we wrap up in the final minute, we have offered you a number of resources that our church provides for us that's so easy out of right now media Yes, that you can do at home. You can access it. You can take it on as a growth group or a life group or a small group study. So many opportunities that our church offers us. And this is the review. And as we said, we want to leave affirming one another encouraging one another, and then thinking about purposely what you want your marriage to look like and what legacy you are leaving. And if you're here, I, I want to encourage you also, use Right Now Media. If you want Sue and I to come to your growth group and talk, if you want to do uh, love and respect in your growth group and you want some material supporting that, we have handouts for each lesson in love and respect. That we we'll have, give to you. That we'll give you. You can leave. Right? It has discussion questions and makes for a great group uh, growth group topic on marriage. Same thing with sacred marriage. Gary Thomas, probably one of the best studies on marriage. We're going through Art of Marriage. And we're doing Art of Marriage in our group, growth group as we speak. So we are, are a resource, and there are many resources. There should be no desert environment when it comes to marriage at First Baptist Church. Okay? Questions? Final thoughts? So, you know, when it, in the Army, and we're out of time, but in the Army, at the end of every exercise, we do what we call a hot wash, three up, three down. And that's, that's simply, what, what are three things that went well, and what are three things that could improve? And so we want to hear from you very quickly, three things that you think went well in this marriage time of six weeks. Just delivery. Thank you. Anything else? What, what impacted you? Putting God first. The discussion on covenant, I hope. I hope that's ingrained in your brain because anytime you're around us, we're going to talk covenant versus contract. Comedy humor. Comedy. Yeah, we love comedy. <laughs> marriage, is, marriage is just a great topic that, that induces comedy. I mean, we know that. We see that. Three, three things that you would like to see done better or topics that weren't addressed that should have been addressed, but how can we do this better? The Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay. 
Thank you. Absolutely true. Right. That's what differentiates us from the world. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, as Sue said, different. And we rely on that as we walk alongside couples, because uh, there is conviction when you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We're convicted of sinful behavior and we're convicted to repent. And that's what sharpens us in marriage. And that's what makes us holy. That's right. Amen. Thank you, sir. Anything else? We're not. We're not. <laughs> you can keep up with us, so you might as well like, give in nicely, so that you get better clarity on the issue. Better clarity on the issue. Okay. Uh, I I don't know. <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, actually, you know, I tell you, the church just invested big bucks on these. We we have visited many churches. We have done this in many spaces. This is some of the best quality video out there in the church space, at least, that we're familiar with. So I just offer that as a, I, I know, oh, the actual video itself. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Because I was going to say th these are exceptional. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, that is an excellent point. Um, we, yes, we were making some of the, we've done this for 14 years, but for this Marriage Matters, we were creating some of this material. And so, yes, we need to get better to make sure that the handouts match the slides and that you're not searching for something while we're talking. Okay, okay. Just the quality of the video. Got it. What else? Do you like having videos, though, that type of... Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. You. Good, good, good. Okay, I'm going to close in prayer because I've already kept you way too late. Sorry. Heavenly Father, thank you. I thank you for each one here. I thank you for the marriages represented here. I thank you for the lives represented here. And uh, most importantly, I thank you for your designed for marriage. You're wholly designed for marriage, Lord. You love this thing called marriage. Teach us each day to appropriate your truths and your word about marriage and instill them in our marriage and instill them in our children that they may see what a godly marriage looks like. Bless us this week, Lord. Help us to be light in a dark world. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.